This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from sunny, warm Provo, Utah. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. Um, I just want to make a really quick service announcement. Um, we are starting new shows on devchat.tv. Um, we have shows coming up on React, Vue, and Elixir, and we'll put links to all of the Indiegogo campaigns for those. Um, essentially, I'm just setting the minimum to what it costs me to produce them for six months. Um, that way I can find sponsors, and then you don't have to pay for them. Um, the sponsors can pay for them. So anyway, just uh, tossing that out there. We have a special guest this week, and that is Adam Baldwin. Hey, everybody. Now, Adam, uh, you've been on the show before, and I think we did a My JavaScript story as well, but do you want to just remind people who you are, what you do? Yeah, I'm Adam Baldwin. I consider myself the malicious actor, not unlike the movie actor. Uh, I do mainly uh, security-related uh, work. So I run the Node Security Project, uh, which uh, I should say I run the Node Security Platform because we donated the Node Security Project uh, and it's dated to the Node Foundation, uh, and I run Lyft Security. So... Uh, I've been doing uh, many, many years of application security focused uh, work. Nice. Now, do you want to give us kind of the uh, two minute elevator pitch for the um, node security project or platform? Yeah, that gets a little confusing between the two, but we can we can go with either. Uh, the two minute elevator pitch would be uh, it's a uh, it started as a project to evangelate, uh, evangelize sort of good security practices within the node community. Uh, and it's evolved into a set of tools and services uh, to sort of continually monitor uh, for security issues within your JavaScript-related projects. Gotcha. Now, usually when I'm thinking about security, I'm thinking about bad actors from the outside coming in and <laughs> messing with my project, right? And so, um, you know, you see some of that with web development. You know, they're trying to get uh, a script tag into my page or you know, get data out of my database or what have you. And a lot of this just comes down to like uh, good platform security on my Linux ins installations and crap like that. Um, what what kinds of security concerns should we have as node developers? So as node developers or JavaScript developers, uh, we have the same, we have the same security concerns in general. So the same things were, which you sort of related to, which like, SQL injection, right? If you're having to use a SQL platform, you, you have to worry about SQL injection. If you're using the web, you have to worry about content injection or, or cross-site scripting, such as you, you related as well. Uh, or if you're using a NoSQL database like Mongo, uh, with the Express platform, um, specifically, you have to, uh, that, that combination there, you have to worry about like NoSQL injection, right? Where you, uh, where you can make complex queries and things like that. Now, we have to worry about all the same things as for like all the other platforms uh, or languages sort of have to deal with. Um, and we, we have um, uh, an additional sort of uh, thing to worry about. Um, and it's not unlike other platforms such as Ruby with Ruby gems or, you know, Python with PyPy. Uh, we also have NPM, right? We have NPM, we have this registry. Um, However, our dependency trees tend to be deeper uh, uh, than most other platforms, right? We, we have this concept of small sort of composable modules in the Node ecosystem. So what that means is you're bringing in a lot of third-party code, which is, again, not unlike other platforms. You're bringing in a lot of other authors as well. And so, um, you know, something that we have to worry about is that, is that you not only bring with you um, their sort of 
maybe good or bad code as those dependencies. Uh, we all we bring with the uh, with those modules or with those actors or those authors. You bring with their security habits or lack of security habits, uh, which could mean that they don't use good passwords to secure their uh, account on NPM, right? Which is probably not the case, which is probably the case as well for other registries as well. But because you have just that many more, uh, that surface area is much larger, um, say with Node. Interesting. So are you evaluating things across NPM or, you know, are, are you doing other things in the Node community as well? So uh, for for Node Security Platform, we focus if it's inside of NPM, it's within scope. That's that's sort of our okay um, guideline, right? So if it's if it's hosted inside of NPM, that kind of becomes our problem. Uh, and we look for all kinds of stuff. Not only if if we're just auditing sort of like the top 100 for you know sort of like those known problems, which you kind of alluded to, um, but also we uh, we look through the registry for. Um, things that people may have leaked. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, breaches in the news recently of, of like large scale, like customer data dumps and things like that related to leaked uh, Amazon keys, uh, S3 oh, keys. Wow. Yeah. And we find a lot of those in the registry. Now, if, if somebody has their Amazon key in the, in their repo in the registry, aren't they compromising their own security and not necessarily mine? Yeah, that, that you're right. We kind of crossed the cross the line there, but uh, um, you are you are in fact correct. Like if they do happen to leak something in with their module, they're they're impacting you know their environment. Um, one interesting aspect of that though is that uh, we found keys that were leaked in somebody's uh, personal module that was a token for a company. And so organizations, that's something that they should be keeping sort of track of is yeah. uh, what keys and credentials are out there where, um, you know, and I won't name particular companies, but they're companies that paid out bounties for these tokens being revealed to them. Um, and the, like, again, they were, they were accessing like uh, internal uh, company data. Um, they, they were keys to the kingdom type tokens, right? Wow. So, so what what does the Node um, security platform do for me? I mean, usually when I'm doing npm or Node stuff, it's npm install. It pulls down a whole bunch of stuff that I don't really pay much attention to, and then I'm in my I, I'm just being honest, right? And I think a lot of people are this yep. way. Um, and and you know, and then I'm off to the races. I don't even think twice about oh, gee, somebody might have something in here that completely compromises my system. So and so how, that's what how do you want, help with that? That's what we want to make easy for you. So <clears throat> while we're not part of the npm install process, after you've done that npm install, or even before you've done that npm install, as long as you have a package JSON or a shrink wrap or a package lock file, depending on the combination of those three, um, and we also support yarn, uh, yarn lock through like mm -hmm. a preprocessor type thing, um, but for those files, you basically run NSP checks. So if you're if you're just using the open source CLI, you can install the NSP uh, tool. So you know npm install NSP G, or you can use the wonderful NPX tool from npm. You know npm, or excuse me, NPX NSP, and then check. And then if you run that within inside of your project directory, it's going to send your uh, package, you know, JSON, etc., up to our API. Um, and we're going to blow up um, the entire dependency tree for that moment in time. We're going to instantly sort of like create that dependency tree. And then we're going to look through the entire tree looking for, is there any package in there that matches something in our database? Uh, if there is, it just gives you a report on your command line, uh, which sort of like, here's sort of the details. You know, you can look at sort of like, oh, you need to upgrade to version, you know, you know 1.01 or whatever. Right. Um, and so that kind of gives you, you can plug that into your CLI process because there's sort of like command line arguments that you can, uh, if it's, uh, you know, if you see a warning, you know, break your build. Uh, or if you see a warning and it's, you know, above the severity, break the build. Uh, you can do those things with the, the command line CLI. Now, the other half of it, which is the commercial sort of service side, is the, the node security.io service, which hooks into your Git repo. 
which has Git hooks to when you have a new PR come in, it'll auto test it. Uh, or every night, you know, so if we publish new advisories overnight or if you have a repository that's sort of sitting stale and not being touched, so there's no PRs coming into it, uh, we'll continue to check those sort of on a nightly basis and have a web UI around that as well as sort of Slack hooks and email hooks for notification. So why continue to check it every night if you're not getting PRs and stuff? Because bit rot is real. Um, bit rot? Bit rot is real. That sounds like uh, the name of a band. I've yeah. got a little bit uh, rot on, on the heel of my foot. Man, uh, heard, <laughs> it's it's weird. The latest album by bit rot. Digital things sort of, you know, atrophy, right? Over time, uh, they stay still, but the ecosystem sort of around them evolves. And so new, <clears throat> let's say you have a project that depends on, say, Express. And it's been working great for you. And you rent, you put the service out in production and you haven't touched it, uh, you know, in a half a year. And all of a sudden, some researcher comes along and decides to look at Express or maybe one of its sub modules and finds uh, a vulnerability. Um, and we update our advisories. Well, if we don't sort of continually check, uh, you'd never then know that that was a thing out in your environment. So we want to sort of like put that in front of you that, hey, this might be a thing that you care about on this service that maybe you're, you know, you're running over here. So. Gotcha. Okay. So what about um, like how often do repos need to be checked to be effectively watched? Is it really like every day? Uh, you know, it really depends. Like I think last year, New Year's Eve, I published 144 new advisories, um, which I was just kind of bored on New Year's. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was sick of sort of trickling them out there, so we just put them out there. Um, but most, you know, really – there's new advisories every few days or every week, right? Like we just do it at a night, nightly basis because that's a nice cadence. Um, but, you know, it's automated. It happens in the background. You don't actually have to do anything. So the computer does it for us. It does our bidding for us. Okay. So sorry, I joined the call a little bit late. But um, did, did you explain what advisories are? Nope. So, uh, yeah, I just kind of assumed, well, that's, uh, that's fun. So an advisory is just simply... Uh, it does that. It sort of advises you on uh, a situation. So it says, uh, here's a situation with a module uh, that we think is impacting to this sort of level of severity. Here's the details of, uh, of why it's impacting and sort of like what the vulnerability is, like what, what situation is it creating? And then what can you do, right? Should you update? Uh, is there absolutely nothing you can do? Um, it tries to give you enough information that you can make sort of some actionable decision um, within your code base, right? Are you vulnerable? Should you ignore it? Uh, those kind of things. Now, is there a convenient way to stay on top of these? Because I can imagine that, again, you know, I just NPM install and I don't really think much about it. But, you know, if there is a package out there that I'm using that I should be aware of, is there like a feed or something somewhere that, you know, I can see these things kind of float by and go, oh, I'm actually using that package. I better go check it out. Um. So if you do sign up for uh, NodeSecurity.io, you can get advisories for every one that comes out, and it can you can hook into Slack or get an email. Everyone loves email. More email, more email. Oh, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> um, we don't have an RSS feed. I broke it years ago, and I've never fixed it. And uh, we don't stream it out to Twitter. Uh, we do have at NodeSecurity.io slash advisories. It is there. Um, we do, however, recommend that you just plug those tools in to let the tools handle it. So, again, if you have Travis or Circle CI or something, uh, you just put that NSP check as part of your, your build uh, and have it maybe throw up a warning, maybe have it not have it break the build, but then you're at least going to be alerted. And you don't have to remember as a developer to do a thing. Like, you already have to NPM install. Like, don't don't have to remember to, like, just run this other tool, right? So right. I, I suggest just hooking it up as part of your part of your process. So how do you how do you get that installed in your project so you can uh, run it as part of your continuous integration? So, however you would normally sort of do your npm install process as part of Travis, so it'd be part of Travis or Circle or whatever your CI is of choice. They're going to have that sort of uh, manifest of commands to run, and NSP check is going to be simply one of those. Uh, you install it as a dev dependency, and then you'd you'd just run NSP okay. check as that. Uh, and if you use the 
the NodeSecurity.io service, it would be just a you know auth with you know link your GitHub account and then click the repositories you you want to hook it to. One other thing that just related to that, um, I know a lot of our listeners use npm not because they're using Node on the back end of their web applications, but because they're pulling in packages on the front end and then they're using another system. For example, I do Ruby on Rails on most of my projects. And, right. uh, you know, so I pull in the packages and then I tell Rails Asset Pipeline to pick up those uh, files and do the build and things like that. Um, or I'll have Webpack, uh, you know, do the build that way. And so even though I'm not using Node, it just runs off of the package dot um, json and the package lock file, and we'll right. just pick that up anyway, right? Yeah, as long as you have that package json file, and so your your build pipeline uses whatever it gets from there, uh, which is coming from the npm registry, right? So yep. as long as you have that package json, uh, NSP would still be able to consume that and tell you. Nice. All right, so have we already discussed the differences between this and, and like, GitHub's new uh, security service and even just talked about GitHub's, like, security notifications and service and what that is? No, so um, it's it's very similar in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of their data is going to be, is going to come from, you know, scraping CVEs, advisories, which were generating and providing that data up into the CVE ecosystem, right? So uh, a lot of that's going to be, uh, consumed from what we're doing um you know differentiating is uh well it's built into github right so there's that that thing um but the one thing that's missing that i think is is really important and that that we have built as part of the node security.io uh platform we don't have it as part of the nsp cli um it's sort of the action like you can take action so you can within the ui of the node security.io tool uh, and this is available with another tool uh, called Sneak as well. Um, you can actually apply and you can say, I want to submit a PR to bump this dependency, which will address that vulnerability. So there's immediate, immediate sort of actionable uh, thing that I can, the thing that I can do. Um, and so that's a, that's about the extent of, of where I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the GitHub tooling sort of falls down. Um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, belittle their efforts because I think anytime we can get uh, security data out and in front of uh, developers, as long as it's not just noise, because what we don't want is we don't want alert fatigue, right? We get more email and so we just start to ignore it, right? We, do, we get more alerts, so we just start to ignore them. And that's another thing too, is that just sort of, um, you can just sort of push and click and get rid of those notifications and they're gone forever within sort of the GitHub tooling is, is far as I know. And, um, you know, we want to be, we don't want too many and we, we want those out in front of people. We don't want a plethora of them. So we want to be able to take, we want to address them and make them go away in an actionable, uh, fashion. Okay. So here's a scenario. I'm a developer and I hate security crap. What do you tell me? Are you really a developer? No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So first of all, part of part of being a developer is that twenty percent of caring about you know security and a little bit about performance and a little bit about usability. Um, so, so <laughs> I was too busy making jokes. Restate your question. Well, so the point is, if I'm a developer and I'm, and every time people talk about security, I sort of just roll my eyes because what I want to do is just mm -hmm. build code, right? And I, yep. I think this is a relatively common perception uh, perception yeah. right like how, what what are things that can uh you can either tell another developer who, who is like that if you're a developer who really cares or if you're the guy here on the show saying listen and there's a whole bunch of developers listening to this and the only reason they are is because they're on their commute and they ran out of other other podcasts and so now they have to listen to the security <laughs> episode right what do you what do you tell them to get them to you know what spend a little bit of time and, and care about this a little bit yeah, I mean, you can't. It's the you know, you bring a horse to water, you can't make him drink, right? You can't, you can't make somebody care about it. And for a lot of those developers that simply don't care, the motivating factor for them will be the pain when they deal with a breach or a compromise. So, if you don't want to hate your future self in dealing with sort of 
that breach scenario or that sort of embarrassing situation, you take some time to care about that today. Now, that's about as far as my you know pitch goes there. Um, I think it's okay to also just, you know, the security person to me says, oh, you need to incorporate security uh, while you build things. Well, to be honest, we're half the time just trying to make it work. And so I think that's okay uh, to just forget about security, forget about performance, forget about usability for a moment, and just write the damn code and, you know, figure out how to make it work and then rely on process to sneak in. It's, it's an iterative process, right? And so you, you do that through, maybe you don't care about code, but you have a peer, uh, sorry, not code, but, but security. Maybe you have a peer that actually does care about it. Um, and so you can sort of like cowboy up your, your code, and then you can bring in people to sort of like uh, evaluate that and get that feedback. And what happens is, is you may not have cared about it while you're writing it the first time. But as you get that feedback and as you sort of like uh, go through that process, the next time you write code that's similar to that, that, that sort of spidey sense is going to tingle that you made that mistake la- last time. You're going to get dinged on it in your, you know, sort of peer review, your code review, um, and it's going to come up, right? And so, you you know, you kind of fix it up after you've got it working and you, you fix that piece up. And so, it's a way of, of maybe not caring, but you're going to write better code. Um, and, and those things are going to come up. Um, Especially when you're sort you 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 surround yourself or get advice from sort of peers um, or code reviews from peers that that care about those areas in which you may not care about but you know that you may need to improve on, which may not just be security it may be other areas, uh, accessibility, design, whatever. I like that. It's good answers. Yep. So let's say that I add this. Um... CLI component, and I'm assuming I can just npm install something, and it gives me a. Uh, you you said you added as a dev dependency, but yeah, it gives me a command line uh, tool that I can run in my CI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it tells me when there's a vulnerability in one of my um, packages that I'm using or one of their dependencies. Uh, the thing that I'm interested in is, I mean, wh- wh- what else is there to think about with security? I mean, other than the packages. Um, things that people expose. I'm sure I can make dumb mistakes all on my own that will expose vulnerabilities in my own apps. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, known vulnerabilities in uh, in packages is, is a very baseline, uh, you know, sort of um, thinking, right? So, like, if you, like, for the... Okay, I'll start over. So, in terms of, of security, there's no reaching a destination. Uh, a good way to think about security is like walking up an escalator backwards. So if you stop, where do you end up? Right, you you end up back at the bottom, and and you that's the way it, it sort of works. So to sort of keep up, you sort of have to keep up with with trends and the new attacks and, and things like that. And and that's just sort of reading the news and and you know becoming aware of of the new things sort of like coming down. Uh, you know, sort of like the gossip chain, right, of, of sort of new things that come out as the research comes out. Um, I can't give an exhaustive list because for every application, it has a different um, different sort of threat model, right, different technology stack. Um, and I think about sort of finding ways to improve my code. Uh, like, um, I always think about it as like watching my kids learn, they have no preconceived notions about how the systems in my house work, right? They know that the candy's in the cupboard. And if they want it, they're going to figure out how to get past the childproof lock, right? They start out by just sort of like, you know, banging on the cupboard and like pulling on it. Uh, but they observe and they learn and soon enough they know to push. Well, you know, we get into it by pushing this, you know, sort of latch to something. We reach our hand in and we, you know, and so they, they sort of observe and, and learn that way. Um and then pretty soon they learn that, oh, I can push that down, I can open the cover, and I can get to it. Um, and there's other ways you know, to do that. Their arm might be skinny enough to reach in and get whatever they want or whatever. But they, um, they have no preconceived notion of how those systems work. Um, and so um, what they do, though, is that they, they uh, by learning how the, those, those attacks, it makes them uh, efficient. And so what, as a developer... You know, you can sort of go about your merry way, and you're going to make your mistakes, and they're going to get pointed out to you, and you're going to learn about them. And so, it, it, if you then take 
um, and you want to be more efficient and more knowledgeable and you want to squash those mistakes, you look at the technology stacks that you're using and you uh, look up the vulnerability types uh, for those particular uh, technology stacks, browsers, uh, SQL servers, no SQL servers, you know, message systems, file systems, whatever. Those are going to turn up those attack types and reading about them will uh, will make you more knowledgeable, right? You're still going to make mistakes. Every developer makes mistakes. Uh, every security mer- person that reviews code misses things in code as well. We're we're, we're still humans, um, and so those those things will make you um, you know more efficient. And then, sort of lastly, you know my my take for finding vulnerabilities is you look for where the input goes in the application. You look for how the data flows throughout the application and where is it at, where does it end up. That's the that's the technique that I've used for for many many years for finding vulnerabilities and it works for me. Um, and you know, the, in in lieu of having an exhaustive sort of checklist, that's my sort of generic methodology for for f- like finding bugs and, and knowing what sort of mistakes I might make. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Pretty methodical way of looking at it. Um, I want to go back to node security here for a minute. Um, so on the node security platform, uh, how, how do you find the vulnerabilities in the, you know, in the NPM packages and stuff? Is it through static analysis? Do you have people report stuff? Uh, is it a little bit of both? Are you just really, really smart and you have an intuitive grasp of where these things are going to show up? Uh, it's a little bit of all of those. Uh, we get a lot, a lot of reports about uh, vulnerabilities from the community. So either those are security researchers that are uh, at companies that, oh, my company just adopted Node and now I want to, you know, now we're auditing all these things and we found these things. So, you know, here, here, here's a couple of vulnerabilities. Uh, we scrape GitHub issues and look through those uh, for, you know, security related material, trying to find things that were publicly reported uh, and then not reported to us. A lot of package maintainers self disclose them. We really like that when a when a maintainer uh, they find something or somebody somebody reports something to them they fix it then they just report it up uh, up the chain to us uh, which which helps out the community quite a bit and then uh, you know we do our own research um, which is a significant portion of the vulnerabilities in the in the database um, are just experiments that we've tried uh, we find one pattern um, and this goes back to sort of static analysis we find one pattern like childprocess.exec, user input in a childprocess.exec. Um, we've built the tooling to be able to take a pattern like that and just run it across the 3 million tarballs in the registry and then just to, you know dump out a report. And then and then from there, it's human intuition. It's going down through those and, and sort of picking out, um, you know, which ones uh, look look juicy, right? And, and that comes from just years of auditing and intuition. Uh, but it follows that practice of, well, if this child process.exec call has a variable in it, but that variable does, never comes from a user provided input, it's not going to be vulnerable. So we, you just sort of like pick up those patterns. Um, it's a little bit of, uh, of all those is, is where we source, source things. And when you find a vulnerability, what do you do? Cause in a lot of cases, it's reckless. If you find a vulnerability that nobody knew about a zero day, um, to disclose it publicly without giving the maintainer or developer a chance to fix it. Yep. So if we find it, um, you know, my personal practice is to uh, email the maintainer. Uh, if the maintainer doesn't respond in a week, uh, try to try to you know email them again. Right? They're people with jobs. Uh, this is open source. Um, you know, they may not have got the email. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Right? Hit them up. Sometimes I'll ping them on Twitter. Just to see, you know, uh, do they have any interest in doing this? Uh, some maintainers will just say, "Well, open an issue," because the, you know they know that their module may be not that important, uh, and the vulnerability isn't that severe, and right. so it's just open an issue and you know let the community hash it out. And that's an acceptable thing for some modules of some importance uh, with some severity of, of advisory or vulnerability. Uh, for other things. Um, if we reported it, it you know, or or say somebody reported it to us, and, and those sort of things go un uh, unfixed, uh, we have a, a forty five day uh, window, which will um, which is at our discretion. So if, if we feel that it's not that impacting, and you know, it hasn't been fixed, we'll just publish an advisory, 
And usually what we see what happens is, is that we publish those. It pops up in somebody's, you know, alert through their, you know, the continuous monitoring through node security. And then an issue gets opened and it gets fixed. Um, and so that's usually what happens. Um, and there's some that we have found and that we're, we're currently sitting on that haven't been fixed. The authors haven't responded on that it's of a significant high severity for a very large uh, percentage of the ecosystem that we're, that we will try to work with companies that rely on these modules or these stacks. We'll try to reach out to them. Uh, in the past, we've had um, uh, Nearform uh, has had some of their employees help out fixing, you know, some regular expression denial service vulnerabilities in a module. And so we'll reach out to those companies and try to get them to donate some resources to, to just maybe fix it up if they can. Um, that way we're not going to be dropping this you know, sort of high severity thing onto the, onto the wild. Uh, not all researchers share our uh, wanting to do sort of cooperative you know, or coordinated disclosure. Um, and so what happens is, is they'll get, uh, you know, they'll get antsy and they'll, you know, write a blog post or, you know, uh, a paper or something and, and drop it out there. Or they'll just open issues themselves, no matter the severity, just to get their sort of, you know, ego, um, going. And, uh, and so then at that point we just, we just make it public because then we're going to notify as many people as we can and try to give them some sort of, of guidance as to, Maybe they should replace it with this module or, you know, do X, Y, or Z. For you, the listeners of JavaScript Jabber, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Makes sense. And, and I, I think we all appreciate that you try and be responsible about how those get disclosed to minimize the negative impact. It's quite a bit of work. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. It, communication can be quite a bit of work. And we're a small team. So sometimes we fall behind and, you know, we get some plaque for that. But uh, so well, we try. It's, it's still the open source ecosystem. I'm I'm guessing you're probably not getting paid for the time you put into this. So, no, we you know the 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 platform brings in a little bit of a little bit of cash to pay for its hosting, and you know that's about it. But uh. so, what about npm? Um, you know, we have some notes here that uh, you prepared for us, and uh, you know, so you mentioned two factor authentication for npm and things like that, and it. It's another thing that I don't think we really think about, and that is the security of the actual package system mm. where, you know, I don't want somebody going in and, you know, having modified Lodash so that it sends up whatever information, you know, I pass through it or something like that. So, you know, how, how do they protect us on that end so that somebody can't go in and do something malicious? Yeah, we've had a good relationship with NPM over the last, uh, well, it's been probably five years now since I've, five, five or more years since I've reported the first vulnerabilities uh, to Isaac, back before NPM Inc. wasn't even a, a thing. Um, and then since then, since they've gotten funding and, and you know, had the ability to sort of, you know, hire us, uh, on the lift security side, we do penetration testing, security audits. And so one of the things there is that we've, we've had the, the pleasure of sort of, of helping them along with, with doing audits and finding vulnerabilities and, and fixing those things. Um, so, so that's one way that, that we've helped protect there. The other way, um, you know, so just some of the security features that they're adding, right, um, which they already have, uh, you know, they check integrity. The installer checks, you know, SHA integrity. Uh, they're moving to a sort of a variable integrity uh, system where, um, you know, as, as they update or change, uh, you know, complexity for, for, hashes are moving from SHA-1 to SHA-256, uh, which is great. Um, so the integrity gets checked there. 
Um, and they've also added then uh, two-factor authentication uh, this year, which which is a huge win, uh, considering um, there are a number of people which uh, choose to use uh, weak passwords um, and do so on very popular projects, right? Or maybe a dependency of a very popular project. Um, the challenge there is getting people to turn it on now, um, which which we need to do, right? Uh, so we've been urging people to uh, to turn it on whenever we can. Um, it, it doesn't really get in your way. Uh, you can turn it on for just authenticating, um, or you can turn it on for publishing as well. So um, you know, any package author I think should have that enabled uh, just to prevent you know uh, tampering of of your modules. Totally agree. One other thing that I'm seeing in here is uh, typo squatting and malicious, malicious packages. Oh, yeah. And and that was another thing that, again, I just hadn't thought about. But, I mean, I fat finger stuff. And so, yeah, what if I go install um, old dash, ol dash, instead of low dash, right? And then I get something that I didn't really want. Yeah, so that's the, the, the thing that on the registry that gets the biggest sort of bad rap is install scripts. Uh, so when you install uh, an npm uh, package, there are these you know post install scripts and install scripts that run. They're just they're just shell scripts, right? They'll execute whatever commands you want, uh, and they get bad raps all all the time, right? Oh, oh my gosh, anybody can publish a module. Um, the challenge is is that you have to get somebody to install that module, right? You can publish any you know garbage piece of code to npm. You have to get somebody to install it, right? And so this is where um, Typo squatting uh, comes in. So if somebody actually, uh, you know, uh, the, the two ways to, to get malicious code installed, right, is through either compromising somebody's account uh, is, is one good way. Uh, and then, of course, typo squatting. So typo squatting meaning that, uh, uh, you know, you, you fat fingered somehow, like, like you said, old dash or, uh, you know, um, you know, ugify JS or is it ugify dot JS or the copy script or is a copy dash script, right? Uh, and that was the first proof of concept that I published was, I believe it was copy script without the dash, which has now been taken over by the copy script uh, project. Um, but originally it was just a package that did nothing uh, except say like, if you find this, please email, please email me at, uh, I, and it was, it was, took about a week to catch that module. Um, and uh, there was a couple hundred installs at the time. And I think that if I had actually mimicked the behavior of CopyScript, uh, it would have taken a lot longer. Um, and that's what we're seeing now, uh, is we're seeing a lot more um, packages. Uh, you know, the latest trend is installing CryptoCoin miners, so mining like Monero or you know, something else. Um, but they really can do, you know, just about anything. Um, and we've seen them do just about anything from. Uh, sending back environment variables to you know opening reverse shells to some command and control server. Uh, you know one thing we do so so we're not doing nothing about that. Um, NPM does uh, has some efforts going to uh, monitor for uh, typo squatted packages, and I think that we're going to see a lot more uh, in the future, sort of coming out trying to combat that that particular problem. Right. So, what's your favorite security story? What's your, you know, what what's kind of the the dumbest or silliest or funniest or scariest thing that you've seen working on this project? Oh, well, that's an interesting one. I think, you know, the ones that that I've really been interested um, lately um, is the is the typo squatting. Being able to detect the the one that I'm interested in the most is the typo squatting, particularly is is a package that I install going to do something nefarious? Um, and being able to d detect that and right, that's 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 you know a halting problem uh, hard. Um, but it's um, it's a really fun one to work on, right? We built a lot of tooling around being able to uh, analyze. Uh, so what we do right now is we take a module, we install it within a Docker container, we instrument that Docker container, we record every single system call that's made. Uh, and then we apply sort of just like, you know, pattern logic to those system calls to say, you know, why did, uh, you know, NPM, uh, you know, install script, um, make a connection out to, um, you know, some host, uh, 
you know, that's not GitHub or Fastly, which is the NPM, right? Um, and be able to detect like, oh, well, that's uh, and then and then to be able to look at the data that it actually sent over that chain, right? Or why did that process read the NPM RC and it wasn't NPM, right? And be able to detect those things for for very quick uh, turnaround and sort of malicious code within the registry. Uh, so that's been fun for me. I think, you know, the, the, the silliest things, um, you know, gotta be, you know, individuals using bad passwords. And then, you know, when you re reset their credentials, they, they set it back to their bad password. Um, you know, I hate to shame people. Um, but we got, we have to step up and take a little bit more responsibility for, for our role within the open source ecosystem, especially if you're publishing as an author. Um, and then of course, um, you know, just just the vast amount of leaked data um, that I've found within the registry, um, anywhere from you know npm install tokens, which which we have a, a system with npm to invalidate almost immediately now, um, so we can uh, we can send those to npm and have them invalidated and have a, a communication sent to the module author, which is great because that can happen right away. Um, and then we also found uh, everything from GitHub credentials to Amazon uh, S3 buckets, and and those were GitHub tokens for GitHub employees. Um, <laughs> no way. S, S3 buckets. Yeah, they paid a bounty on that one. I'll, I guess I'll tell the story on that one. Um, they did pay a bounty on that one. Uh, so they they paid two bounties on those. Uh, one was for a GitHub token for a GitHub employee, which gave access to internal repositories. Um, and then the other one was, um, the NPM RC token for the electron, uh, the electron app. So, um, the, the, the NPM auth token that gave me access to basically publish on top of electron. So they published, they, they, they bound it out for those. And I believe those were public. So, um, but, but API tokens for, for basically everything else under the sun, um, people commit. And then there's, there's, um, there's one really interesting one. Somebody published a, a type of squatted module that was a, uh, I think it was a crypto coin miner, if I remember correctly. Uh, but they left in a swap file of a file that they were editing uh, in process as they did an NPM publish. And what I don't think they knew is that a swap file contains a uh, host name as well as a username um, for the machine that they're working on. Oops. And so that was fun uh, tracking down on LinkedIn. But. Uh, yeah. If you track uh, them down, is there anything you can do? I don't know. I didn't send them anything, but I, I found the person. I'm pretty sure it was them. Uh, but uh, I mean, we, we got rid of their stuff and, and, you know, I don't think that they meant, uh, I mean, I, I think we'd probably take it further, but uh, there's nothing really I can do. Yeah. There, I mean, there's been a lot of things over the years and I think that, that, you know, NPM as a whole is taking the, the, it's taking the concern of the community and the, the safety and the, the, the integrity of, of what they're serving you know, fairly seriously. Uh, you know, every year it's just an iteration. Uh, they're going up that, that escalator and they're continuing to walk it and make progress and, uh, you know, make things better than it was, you know, five years ago when, uh, you know, the first vulnerability I reported to Isaac was the, that couch, couch TV used to have this thing called admin party, right? Where when you first set it up, all the admin users, as well as all the admin hashes, were available. And so while the passwords were hashed, um, I think they were a SHA format. Um, you could just put them into a password cracker, right, and, and guess them. Um, and so that was kind of the first, uh, you know, first vulnerability that we, we ever reported to Isaac. And then that got buttoned down and that sort of like started this, this ongoing trend of just sort of like finding, finding issues and improving them uh, over time. So how many people and how much time uh, do you all spend on this project well uh yeah it's kind of a balance we we run a consulting company you know with security along you know which basically funds all those efforts so uh anytime we're not doing client work we're working on that um as well as it's my hobby so basically all the time uh there's three of us that are on the team and then there's been countless people over the years that have sort of helped um you know champion things um Stephen Rivas did, you know, a bunch of design for us early on, right, uh, for the for our website. And, you know, Michael Rogers and, and D. Shaw, Daniel Shaw were, you know, huge sort of 
um, supporters and the, you know, the list kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a long list that, that I couldn't name through, but, uh, there's been lots of, uh, lots of support from the community for, you know, whether that's just finding things, and reporting things, or just sort of, you know, evangelizing by, you know, you know, having us on, you know, a, a podcast and, and, you know, talking about security. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been way more than, than just us. The reason why we don't have a larger sort of like, you know, ecosystem, you know, group of people is that, um, I think security and open source and in, in open source in general is different. Um, a lot of these things have to be private. And so it's like, who do you trust? And it's, it's, I think that's one of the, one of the downfalls of, of the project and, and me not trusting, you know, just sort of random people off the internet. Cause I think we could have had a lot more people helping, uh, you know, how I embrace sort of just letting people, uh, triage things and, and, you know, work on things. And, uh, that may change in the future. So when people ask you, meet you and ask you, what are your hobbies? Uh, basketball, tennis, and security. Yeah, I basically say I do the exact same thing I do for work, uh, and except I also raise chickens. <laughs> awesome. How long have How long have you been like passionate about this, and has this been a hobby of yours? Oh man, the node stuff has been going on since uh, you know. 2002, 2003. Yeah, real like <laughs> forever ago. You know when Node first. Has it been that long? It hasn't been that long, has it? I don't no. know. No, no, six just, years, no. six years or so, um, six seven years maybe. But uh, you know, security has been a hobby. I I got into security when I was 15. I got you know in trouble for doing something stupid. And, um, oh, now we need to hear <laughs> something hear the story? specific. We, we stupid. Get to hear the story. <laughs> I can tell the story. Yeah. Um, when I was 15, uh, I grew up in a small town of you know 1,300 people, and uh, it was a farming community and nothing to do. And we had a bulletin board system, and I was, you know, I could either go help on the farm or I could you know sit and play with this computer that my grandpa gave me. Well, of course I'd do that. Um, and you know, I had an account on this BBS, and of course my friends wanted access to the content that they didn't have access to. And so basically just brute force, you know, passwords until I got the administrator's password. Um, wasn't very sophisticated. It was basically just a lot of typing, um, and not really a lot of, you know, smart attacking, but, um, it was their birthday. Uh, so, you know, that helped. And, uh, I talked too much, right? I was a 15 year old kid and you know, <laughs> a, ton, a ton of 1300 people, everyone already knows what everyone's doing, right? And so as soon as you open your mouth, the entire town knows. And so uh, I opened my mouth and, and you know, got in trouble, uh, you know, with uh, uh, what I thought would be in trouble with the the, uh, the sysop, right? It was what we called the administrator at the time, right? The uh, sysop or the BBS. And um, instead, he, you know, he kind of talked to me about, you know, sort of ethics and, you know, responsibility and, and things like that. And uh, instead sort of gave me an opportunity to, to have a job working for his little computer shop. Well, he, you know, he was the local sort of like county IT person that fixed computers and whatever. So after school, then I got my, I got my first job at 15 by having, uh, done this stupid thing, which I don't know if it was a good idea to sort of like, you know, reward that. But anyway, uh, he, he, <laughs> he gave me the, the outlet to learn programming. He taught me visual basic. He taught me a little bit of C. Um, he taught me reverse engineering. I removed, uh, I remember removing, um, the neg screen from NeoPaint using soft ice debugger, right? Like that was something he taught me how to do. And so like, I got my start into like that curiosity, but also like, um, doing so in a constructive manner, uh, through, uh, through Jim. So like he, he gave me that opportunity and, um, you know, we don't have time for the longer story. I wrote a blog post about it, but turns out that that, that mentorship basically has impacted every single step of my career, um, into basically to where I am today. And so it's, it's been a pretty wild ride, but, uh, yeah. That's cool. Yep. I love hearing the stories. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of stories, I know that we kind of, you kind of gave some already, but any other interesting security stories you want to relate to us? I think we're kind of hitting towards the end of this, right? Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, there's always good stories. Unfortunately, you know, all of the good ones, the good ones that I really like to tell are under NDA. Um, 
that I really don't want to risk breaching. So <laughs> can't change the names of the innocent or the guilty. <laughs> yeah, because you'd figure it out pretty fast um, if I gave any details. But uh, um, yeah, maybe someday I'll get to tell those. So tell us just a little bit more about Lyft Security then. You know, you said you do consulting on security. Wait a second. Um, I got one question. <laughs> yes or okay. no story. Did you read any of Hillary's emails that got deleted? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have better things to do. <laughs> I have better things to do. I have, I have so much email myself. I don't need to read other people's email. <laughs> Although, if you do get somebody's email, it's like the keys of the kingdom, right? Password resets go there. Yep. Right. Everything. It's, yeah. Turn two factor off on for your email. Um, okay. So, Lyft, we'll just, we'll just go right back to that. Um, yeah. Lyft, uh, Lyft has been going on for about five years. We're, we're, uh, we're the same team that runs the node security platform. Uh, we do security auditing of, of basically every technology under the sun. We do a lot of focused things under node. Uh, but yeah, we do penetration testing and code review. Uh, we do a lot of stuff for the registry. We did, uh, uh, testing for years and years for GitHub and, and many other, uh, names that you may recognize. Um, and, uh, yeah, we get to play the, uh, play the malicious actor, right? We get to, uh, it doesn't look like what it looks like on TV, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't look like if you go to hacker typer, I think it's hacker typer.net. You go there and you start typing. Uh, it looks kind of like that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, so we just, we just do, uh, uh, if, if you ever want to, yeah, you go to a coffee shop, you just turn on hacker typer, you just start mashing the keyboard and then you just slam your computer shut and you go, yes. And you just walk out. Um, yeah, no, we just do, we just do penetration testing and consulting, uh, you know, trying to sign to surface those vulnerabilities for companies, uh, you know, before, uh, you know, somebody else finds them. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I I'm curious now. You you brought it up. You it's not like what you see on TV, and uh, <laughs> it's it's so funny because yeah, I'll sit there with my wife, and you know we'll be watching some show. Uh, I think lately the one that I see it the most on that we watch together is uh, Blind Spot, and so yeah, th you know they get on the computer and it's like oh yeah, the, the other one's Criminal Minds, right? You know, I'm a better hacker than them. And I'm like, uh. you know, five five minutes, you know. Oh, well, it might take me a little while to get in. And then, you know, they call them back and, oh, well, we just talked five minutes ago. And it's, Yeah, if you want a good hacking scene, you know, a good movie hacking scene, you look up, I, I think it's NCIS, but if you look up double hacking, uh, it, is, it is a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous good watch. That um, That's the one you can also find. I'm pretty sure the same one you can find it if you uh, look up two idiots, one keyboard. Ah, okay. <laughs> is that like That's those, one of my favorites? Is that like those yeah. YouTube videos where you have somebody playing the guitar and then somebody like reaches over their shoulder and starts playing the guitar too? <laughs> it was. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> it's two people on one keyboard, you know, because they're hacking yeah. twice as fast. Oh right. It's, my favorite's the swordfish scene when he's hacking. It's about the same. Yeah, <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, it, it, I think the one that gets the most realistic points, the, the most recent show is Mr. Robot, right? The, the, the people that they have consulting, the, you know, that are, are, are peers in the industry and, uh, you know, the scenes where they're actually like cloning RFID badges and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. those are, those are real tools, right? Like I have the same tool in my closet, right? Um, and they work and we use, you know, you can use them on, on physical pen tests and things like that. Right. Like those tools work, uh, and they're realistic. Um, you know, they're adapted for TV to, you know, to shorten their lifespan, but, uh, uh, they're pretty dang accurate. Yeah. So one other thing that just kind of came to mind as we talked through all of this, um, I read ghost in the wires by Kevin Mitnick. Um, and then we're also on Ruby Rogues uh, next week. We're talking to somebody that focuses more on the um, the vulnerability through the people involved in the project. And oh, so yeah. um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how much of your work is technical versus look, you know, here's how you validate that the person asking you for something is somebody who should have access to that something. 
That's policy work. Yeah, that's kind of the process and policy work. I, I've done social engineering work in my past life, um, you know, working for other companies. We don't do uh, uh, any of it at Lyft. Um, there's, there's lots of great companies that do that and focus on that. Uh, I kind of got out of it when I had a little old lady crying uh, that she thought she was going to get fired because she gave me her credentials. So, um, you know, it's it's pretty heartbreaking uh, sometimes to deal with some of that because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with yeah. vulnerability. It makes people feel pretty crappy, and so you have to you have to deliver your debriefs fairly fairly well to to make people feel good at the end of the day that you basically con them. Um, now, you know a lot of that stuff too for like support practices and things, right? Like you know you call into support, um, and th- those are policy things. A lot of times we'll just have discussions over that versus actually doing the testing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, are, is the support people following the you know support procedure, uh, which is funny that. The one question that often gets asked a lot is like, please verify the last four digits of your your billing, your card number uh-huh. uh, it's on the account. Have you ever noticed that that's printed on everything? Like it's printed yeah. on receipts you're going to throw away. It's printed on like, yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, but that's what they use for validation. It, it, I never have understood that, but whatever. Um, and so, you know, bringing up those things and just sort of like, oh, right. You know, we're, we're making sure that people don't click on, you know, links and. Um, you know, just understanding what they can and can't do and then that there's just no tolerance uh, for anything else and that they're enabled to sort of, you know, call BS. Um, you know, a lot of times support personnel, uh, you know, and those personnel, they're there to help. And so as soon as they, uh, you know, pull that sort of red flag, oftentimes they're sort of chastised for, um, for doing that, right? They're going to get, you know, fired or something because the customer is sort of like you're putting the customer first. And so, um, you know, drawing that balance, um, you know, we'll have discussions around some of that, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a pretty small amount of, of any of our, any of our collaborations. Cool. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Do you run your own freelance business or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side? Well, then you need fresh books. Fresh books is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. AJ, do you have some picks for us? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to pick this episode because I thought it was great. Even though I didn't ask a lot of questions, um, you know, I'm a security enthusiast and I really appreciated um, all that Adam had to say. So thank you, Adam. Um, and then I'm also going to pick uh, two books and an album. So, there's this older book by older. I mean like maybe 10 years old or something called free the future of radical price. Probably not even that old, maybe like five years old. Um, and it's about the economics of free and the shifts and tides of how things, the digital age dropping the cost of transactions, cost of assets, et cetera, down to, what it says rounding down to zero where the, the cost per customer is essentially nothing, um, how it's changed the the game of digital economics. And I, I listened to it once before listening to it again. I kind of am interested to see like which of the like predictions or beliefs kind of held true and which ones um, I I'm starting to see like negative effects from versus positive effects. Another book that I'm uh, I keep in the can so I can use every minute of my day effectively is Sam Walton's made in America, uh, learning about the story of the world's most successful retailer and getting some insights from that. And, um, it's very 
very interesting, very cool to read about this guy because he seems like a relatively nice guy. Um, and then I'm going to pick, of course, a VGM album, Sonic Mania Remixed. If you're a fan of Sonic and you want to hear some some sweet tunes, this is one of the best Sonic albums that I have listened to. I'd also put Hedgehog Heaven in there, but um, this one's new. So uh, check that out. And those are my picks. Awesome. Joe, what are your picks? All right. So... Uh... Last night was the premiere of the Psych movie. Psych was a TV show on USA that was relatively popular, and they had the movie came out yesterday. Last night, we actually had a big party at my house. A bunch of people came over to watch it. It was great, truly enjoyable. So, if you are a Psych fan, I highly recommend that. If you're not, I highly recommend Psych. So that's my first pick. <laughs> um. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, pick NG Conf, the big conference that I organized. It's happening in April, and if you're at all into Angular, tickets are still are still on sale. So head over and pick you up a ticket. And then I've been listening to an audio book that has been interesting and pretty funny. I was hoping it would be a little bit more illuminating, but it's less illuminating than it is funny. It's a Dennis Leary called "Why We Don't Suck," and uh, He's kind of like railing against partisan politics, but it ends up being mostly co semi-comical rant and less useful uh, insight, but it's still pretty enjoyable. So it is really super adult. Do not listen to it in earshot of anybody younger than 30. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it has been pretty enjoyable. So, Why We Don't Suck by uh, Dennis, Dennis Leary. Uh, and those are my picks. Awesome. Um, my picks are going to be a little bit more uh, gross, I guess. Um, so last night I had an incident. Um, Your nose. Yeah, it did involve my nose, as a matter of fact. Um, so uh, I was I was up sick most of the night. Um, and I wound up getting some, some stuff in my sinuses that, uh, was anyway, it was this burning sensation behind my eyes and all this stuff. Anyway, my wife has this little thing called a neti pot and she got it when she had a sinus infection and, uh, it just helped clear out her nasal, uh, passages and stuff. And, uh, so anyway, um, that actually helped alleviate a lot of the issues I was having. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm going to pick it, um, not my nose, uh, the neti pot. And uh, <laughs> anyway, it, 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 I, I don't want to go into too much detail because you all really don't need to know the details of, of how awful it was. Um, but yeah, so uh, neti pots are great. Um, and then one other thing that I'm going to pick um so as I've worked through podcast production things and stuff like that, um, a few things that I have run across, and I really like Slack. Um, in fact, um, I'm consolidating all the Slack channels from all the shows just into one devchat.tv Slack channel. And if you go to patreon.com slash devchattv, um, <clears throat> you can you can donate and it'll give you it'll give you the URL where you can go get into Slack uh, for devchat.tv. But um, for my team, Slack is kind of hit or miss in some ways. And so I've switched over to a new system called Convo. And um, I'm really liking it. So it's just much more threaded conversations. Yes, I know Slack does threads. Uh, no, they're just not really kind of front and center on this stuff. And it allows me to start conversations on various different things and then just follow them all separately there. Um, and uh, so anyway, I'm really, really liking Convo. Um, so I'm going to pick that. That's at Convo.com. And it's free if you have less than, I think, five people on your team. So that's working out nicely for me as well. So, uh, yeah. So those are my picks. Adam, what are your picks? Oh, I'm always terrible at this. And uh, my picks always seem to revolve around my hobby, which is security, right? 
the the two things that pop out in my head um, uh, first is Keybase. Uh, Keybase, if you haven't used it, is absolutely amazing for uh, quick secure chat, sort of end to end. Uh, it's 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 a wrapper around PGP, right, or GPG. Uh, it actually makes GPG usable uh, so that you can use it with other people and uh, not have to deal with all the BS of, of you know, exchanging keys and all that other stuff. Um, absolutely fantastic if you, you actually have to send that piece of sort of confidential information to somebody else. Um, I guess uh, the other one would be uh, have I been pwned, have I been pwned.com. Uh, it's great to sort of just pop your email address, uh, on sort of your common usernames in there to see which ones of your accounts may have been come up in a previous, uh, compromise, say of, you know, Yahoo or, uh, you know, LinkedIn or any of those sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, breaches. Uh, and then I, you can sort of, you know, sign up, sign up to get notified if, you know, if they happen to find your email address in a breach again. Um, first of all, you shouldn't be reusing your passwords, but if you happen to be sharing passwords between um, your accounts or that one account with, say, something else because you thought it was a throwaway account, uh, you can be notified about it, and then you know you can go change those passwords, uh, which is a, which is pretty cool. Uh, and that's it. Interesting. So, what's your take then on uh, password managers like uh, LastPass or One Password? Uh, I personally use uh, Dashlane. Um, which is great. That's what all the uh, cool security kids are using these days. They, it, uh, I guess I don't, I just use it. <laughs> it's got, it's got this interesting sort of like, uh, security dashboard, which sort of tells you like, uh, you know, X percentage of your passwords are, are weak or these passwords have been found in, you know, like, uh, in a compromise, um, from like, have I been pwned? Uh, and so you can go through that and like, and, and change them. Um, or rotate them, and so it's got a nice bu- a bunch of buttons too. You can just you know sort of like you just click a button and change your you know your you know Netflix account or whatever, right? Um, and uh, New Year's is coming up, which is when you know you change your uh, change your smoke alarm batteries and uh, you change your passwords as you're you know as you're dealing with uh, January first. So, yeah, awesome. One last question. Um, if people want to see what you're working on these days or they decide they need to hire lift security or something like that, where do they go? Uh, you can find lift security at liftsecurity.io, node security at node security.io. You can see a pattern there. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Adam underscore Baldwin or node security at node security. All right. Well, thanks for coming, Adam. Thanks for having me on. All right, we will uh, wrap this one up, and we will catch you all next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by CashFly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with CashFly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.